motherhood, but not quite as we imagine. Thought-provoking, refreshing, straightforward, sometimes taboo. Often seemingly ordinary, but always honest. Welcome to School for Mothers, opening conversations we all need to have, exploring ways in which you can be fulfilled as a woman, once a mother. Now, here is your host, mother of 10, Danusha Melina Durban. Hello and welcome back to the School for Mothers podcast. I'm Danusha Melina Durban, your host. Vanessa is one of the UK's most well-networked women I mean, truly, she really is. She, she likes to bat that off, but she is. And one of the UK's most prominent figures in gender equality. She was awarded her OBE in June 2018 for her services to women and the economy. At the height of her successful 25-year career in financial services, Vanessa launched the award-winning WeAreTheCity.com in 2008 as a vehicle to help women progress in their careers. WeAreTheCity.com now has over 120,000 members and provides resources, conference, awards, jobs to women across the UK. It's huge, listeners. Vanessa is also the founder of UK-wide diversity forum, Gender Networks, which brings together diversity leaders from 85 cross-sector firms to share best practice on a quarterly basis. Over the past 12 years, she's accumulated more than 20 industry awards, including Women in Banking and Finance's Champion for Women, Financial News Top 100 Rising Star, the International Alliance for Women Top 100 Women Globally, and Brummel's Top 30 London entrepreneurs. In 2015, Vanessa was in GQ, UK's top 100 connected women and the evening standards, a thousand most influential Londoners. Vanessa is a regular guest on TV and radio and also sits on the Government Digital Services Advisory Board. Her book, of course she has a book, called Heels of Steel, Surviving and Thriving in the Corporate World, tracks her career and shares 13 chapters of tips to succeed in the workplace. Now, Vanessa, on top of everything, also is the pearly queen of the City of London, a tradition that's been in her family for over a hundred years. She's an avid charity worker and sits on the board for Cancer Research UK as one of its women of influence. Vanessa also sits on the Centenary Action Group, founded by Dr. Helen Pankhurst, CBE. Oh, see what I mean? I mean, seriously. This episode is packed with wisdom on what serving others really means and the spirit of fierceness. I explore with Vanessa how she sustains herself in and amongst serving so many others, which is particularly timely during the pandemic. Well, come on then, let's dive into today's episode. As you've just heard in my introduction to today's guest, Vanessa is one of the UK's most well-networked women in, you know, that I certainly know as well. So it's a particular pleasure to have her on the show. There's also something else. You know, I haven't had a pearly queen on the show either. And we've, we've had MPs and celebrities of all sorts on the show, but I've never had a pearly queen as a guest. So I'm really excited for a topic of fierce, which by God, Vanessa, you, you exemplify, you really do. So hello, really looking forward to this. Welcome to the show. Hey. Now we are in a corona moment, aren't we, as we record? Indeed. Let's not avoid that because, you know, it's it's changed everything, hasn't it? It's going, it's obviously has to. Very, uh, it, it has. It's changed the landscape of work. It's changed, you know, the time you spend at home, the time you spend with your family. I, I can't think of an area of my life that isn't kind of COVID orientated at the moment. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, originally I wanted us to talk about your your own rise, your own story, which I think really does demonstrate so much of your fierce dedication to to yourself first, but most of all to others as you've as you serve so many people. 
But I, as we are in the COVID kind of situation, I'm wondering what that's doing for the way that you're operating and serving so many people. How, how, how are you coping with everything? I think, you know, when this kind of first bubbled up, I remember going into my office and talking to my team and I said, I think we need to really have a look at what we've got planned for this year in the light of, of this virus. Mm -hmm. Uh, And one of them looked up at me and went, what virus? And I, and I, I actually think that was a lot of people's kind of first question, not so much what virus, but no, surely it won't come over here. Surely it won't affect Mm -hmm. us. And I think, I don't know whether that was an element of burying our heads in the sand or, you know, not looking at the kind of the big macro effect that it potentially had. But I kind of thought if this is going to have the impact that they're saying it's going to have, it will affect every aspect of what we do and our lives and everything. So from a, from a work perspective, we were very quick to kind of pick up on the virtual side of things Mm -hmm. and, you know, virtualize a lot of our schedule, but also to think how can we give back to others during this challenging time? So when things actually started to take a slightly more of a, of a dip, you know, when we started to have, you know, people obviously losing their lives. We was thinking, you know, as, as a, a, what is effectively, you know, a give back personal development company, there's not much we can do to solve that big problem, but what, what could we do to help people if they were going to be uh, self-isolating, if they were going to be at home? So we reached out to a number of individuals, um, originally on LinkedIn, I think it was on the Saturday, and we said, uh-huh. Look, we're going to spin up this set of virtual webinars. Um, will you come and help us? Uh, will you give your time and your expertise? And literally, my inbox was flooded by the Sunday of offers to run sessions. So by the Monday, we had the pay- landing page. By the Tuesday, we had our first four. And I think there's around 21 on there now. We've already run three. Um, wow. There's about another 20 to be added. So I think our initial thought was, how could we help others? That was the first thing. So that was from a work perspective. So kind of team were working on that, shifting everything out. And again, everyone's very understanding. From a home life perspective, a complete different change. I think the first one was my daughter saying she was being sent home from uni. And then the mm. second one was my other daughter saying um, the school's potentially closing. Then my husband working from home. So all of a sudden, from going into work, working with my team, being in London, being very busy with public speaking and having a diary that I look at. And as much as I absolutely love what I do, but sometimes I'd look at it with a sigh to go, how many places have I got to be today? And yes. you know, knowing that I'd have to kind of answer emails when I come home to looking at a diary that's completely free. That was a real surreal moment because it hasn't been like that for the best part of 30 years. So so (laughs) adapting that, being at home with the kids and the dogs and also having aging parents. So being a sandwich generation, you know, I've got, I'm the only child of my mother, so I have to look after her. And Mm -hmm. then Stuart's parents are also kind of in the at-risk bracket. My husband's in the at-risk bracket and so is my oldest daughter. So I'm Mm going to be the one that feeds, delivers, and takes one for the team, um, as it is, as well as kind of running your business and, you know, still trying to run a household and everything else. So, but I look at it. How does that far feel to you, Vanessa? I, I get, I get that it's kind of inevitable because I can hear all the, you know, Stuart's parents and all the at-risk people, but how does it feel being the one that needs to take one for the team? I, I don't know. Maybe it stems from my upbringing. I think, you know, I kind of grew up before my time, even as a kid, because of just me and my mum. So, I'm kind of used to taking control of things, you know, when I've been through many different situations in my life where like there's been crisis points, you know, more Mm. so perhaps when I was younger. So that having to step up, if you like, to take control and say, what can we do? You know, how can we get around it, remain positive, even though you have your moments, you know, I'm not inhuman in any way, you know, where you go, oh my God, this seems so vast and, you know, so a bigger problem to overcome but I don't maybe it's a something that's a bit of a mechanism that's built in me to just to, to step up like that and to try and hold everything together I think it's in every woman to be honest but some of us will just have more a larger scope of things that we need to manage and control but it's just what you do isn't it it's, it's not there's no choice about it you just got to get on with it well, for me, as I listen to you speak, I think it, it really is is what you do in your business life, isn't it? You kind of fiercely step up to yeah. you know, see that other people's progress is not 
hampered and impeded so that you actually open access and make things happen for them. And I'm seeing you do it now in this in this situation. I'm hearing you do it now. So it's like this is so firmly embedded in you as something that you do. You show up, step up, make things happen. Where did this come from? Um, again, I think it goes back to being a kid. Mm-hmm. There, was, there was just me and my mum. So I kind of, as I say, I was a little bit of an adult before my time in terms of we were a team, you know. So we, in the absence of kind of, you know, a father figure or anything like that, she had to work. We had to, and again, no sob story. I absolutely, you know, I love, I wouldn't go back and change an absolute thing. But, you know, I started work from a very young age when you could work at 11. You know, I used to meet my mum from school. We used to do four cleaning jobs of an evening. So we didn't really get into 11 o'clock, but we did what we did to make ends meet. And also, you know, giving me that strong work ethic that if you want something in life, you have to work for it. And sometimes you have to be a little bit more creative and, and take a few risks. You know, mm. they will, you know, it's like even some, some of the things we're doing at Wheel the City at the moment, they're big risks. But I'm thinking, do you know what? I can't. I don't ever want to be one of those people that, you know, sits there and says would have, could have, should have, you know, around trying something new. And I'm not, I think also I'm at that age in life where I'm not that afraid to fail as long as I learn as a consequence of it. And, you know, and, I, and we can kind of come back from it. So I just, I've always mm. had this bit of like, I've got nothing to lose kind of attitude when I was younger. Slightly changed now, obviously I've got mortgage and kids and, you know, there's a, a hell of a lot to lose. And I think times are tight for everyone, but, you know, I think it just, it just comes from that really sometimes being a little bit fearless you know and just trying things new well i think it's the combination of that that essence of fearlessness with the relationship to fi- the failure so not having such a huge you know we all don't I mean, who wants to fail who actually actively runs towards it we don't do we but but many many people actually operate in their in their lives so that they don't put themselves out there they couldn't fail you know, it's very difficult to fail. So what was your, what would you say is your biggest failure if um, if other people look, oh looked at it? Oh, I've got heaps of failures. <laughs> um, <laughs> I took the wrong jobs. I worked for the wrong people. <laughs> I, I mean, before We Are The City, you know, I set up, I set, I've always kind of been setting up businesses on the side. I've always had a bit of a side hustle since I was about 18. But, you know, um, I set up businesses that didn't work. I chose people to kind of work with me that weren't right you know so there's there's not been one great big massive failure but there's been a series of questionable decisions I love that questionable decisions (laughs) to lack of experience and Mm. I kind of learned as I've got older to ask people to help me and and I think as an individual that I love to give that's the biggest thing for me but I can't do half of what I do without you know and, and it always makes me chuckle when people introduce me as the most networked woman, you know, it's a, kind of a bit of a label, but it is that network that enabled me to do what I do. So yeah. even on a project I'm working on at the moment, you know, have an idea, I can mobilize it very quickly down to people that I've known for a long time that know whatever we do, there's going to be a good giving back part of it. And when I call them, I'll send them an email saying, I want to do this. First of all, tell me if I've gone nuts um, by trying this out at this time, but would you come and help me? Um, and say, I very rarely ask for help for myself. It tends to be for someone else, but if they help me to do this, I can do it for so many other people. And I'm always amazed by how many people are willing to help you. And the fact that sometimes maybe even reflecting on myself, I don't ask enough. Yeah. What kind of stops you from having help for you because I've got a little hunch that as as you say you're really brilliant I mean if, if you're a genius at, at mobilizing things on behalf of others to serve others to give to others but I have a real hunch that you don't do it for yourself and I wonder if you deplete yourself oh all the time mm-hmm. yeah yeah I'm completely honest you know sometimes I run myself into the ground with some of my ideas and I think because I can mob- I have to be really careful my husband's a really good grounder for this because I will have an idea and then within two days it becomes a thing and then it becomes a baby and a teenager and something that I have to look after uh, forever. So yeah. she's very, very good at going, whoa, come back here a bit. Think about this. Think about what you're doing because I just get too excited and passionate. So, I, <laughs> you know, and then obviously, you know, you have these multiple children as it was, these ideas. Yes. Before you know it, you're looking after lots of things. Now, 
I've got a fantastic team. There's, we, I don't have a big, massive team. People often think there's about 30 of us behind We Are The City, but there's not actually, there's five. And, mm-hmm. and a few kind of associates and consultants that we use for different things. But they are a very, very well-oiled machine. But there is a bit of a running joke in the office that whenever I go on holiday, because I can't sit still for more than four days, I'm going to come back with an idea. And generally, they duck for cover behind their desks because they know I'm going to come in and say, whilst I was on holiday... I was thinking about this, which generally means the care of my, my I say my virtual babies, if, if you like, um, goes on to my team as well. So Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that. I was talking the other day with Carl Reeder on the School for Fathers podcast, and he was saying that he really doesn't like holidays. You know, he's not a great lover of them. And I was just, I was saying to him that holidays for me are an, oh, this big opportunity to have a think. I, I love the fact that it's not the holiday itself, it's that I find more space. And I think that's a great... There was a, pa- there was a chapter that was taken out of my book. Um, uh-huh. was, it was called Thinking Time. Yes. And I took it out, but it was actually something that was given to me by a coach years ago in one of my corporate jobs. They gave me a coach because I was transitioning from one role to another. It was a slightly bigger role. And he used to... I remember having a session with him and he said, right, you're going to go and sit. It was in Cheapside, Cafe Nero. He said, you're going to uh-huh. go there and you're just going to sit and think. And he took what was my Blackberry away at the time, my pen and paper, because I'm an avid list maker. I make lists of everything. And he said, you're just going to sit there and think. And I'm like, is this what my firm's paying you for? They're paying you for an hour and you're sending me up the calf to think. Do you know how much I could get done in an hour? And I think the lesson <laughs> I learned there that sometimes, you know, what I deem as productivity is physical things, me running around, me sending emails. I, you know, I didn't give enough credence to actually being able to sit there and process my thoughts so that when I do get that active time again, that it's much more effective. Mm. So I'm a big advocate for thinking time, but on the holiday side, generally I can do, I do lots of short four day holidays, lots of mini breaks. Oh, do you? Yeah. Ooh, nice. Rather than long, I haven't been away for a two week stretch for probably the best part of 20 years. So mm. I like lots of little holidays again, because I get too antsy. You know, I can't, I can sit on a beach, I might be able to read a book and I can do that for so many days. And then, then I start conjuring up ideas and, and that's time for me to come home. So it sounds like you haven't made a questionable decision, certainly with your husband. He sounds really good, Vanessa. You've got a good no, one there, eh? Definitely not. I think... You know, when Stuart and I first met, I don't really think he knew what he'd signed up for. Um, <laughs> I am a bit mm-hmm. 90 miles an hour and I've had, I have ideas and it, back in the old days, it would take me a while to mobilise them. But I suppose as you get a bigger network and you get mm-hmm. a bigger set of sports, you can mobilise things quite quickly. And where Stuart is, you know, not only a fantastic dad and a great partner, but he's very good at pulling me back you know, and kind of saying to me, hold on a minute, have you thought about this? Because if you mobilize it, it can be something really big and then you've got to look after it. So he's yes. he's very good from a business partner perspective. And it is quite difficult, you know, when, you know, you have a partner, I think took 21 years, Stuart and I, two kids, we run a business together, you know, sometimes you have to find that time for yourself and, and you have yeah. to decide what times you're work talking and working when it comes to business and what time you're talking and working when, you know, when it comes to your relationship. But how do you do that? How do you segment? Like, do you have, <laughs> it sounds daft, but do you have actual, like, we do these business hours? Because I, I consult with quite a lot of either family firms or, you know, boards, boardrooms with lots of family members in there. And this comes up quite a lot, by the way. How do you segment? Well, I mean, one of our kids hates us talking about work and she's very vocal and very quick to shut the conversation down when it's wow. family time. Um, uh-huh. For he and I, I mean, we tend to like, for example, at the moment with what's going on, we have our one walk a day with the dogs and we tend to have a kind of a, a daily download of kind of work related things and and stuff like that. And we tend to do it in the morning and the kids are not around. You know, a Friday night, generally, if we're having a couple of drinks, it tends to kind of go to work. But again, one of us will and it happens every time one of us will say, I don't want to talk about work. It's Friday. And, and that's yeah. perfectly acceptable. So, you know, I think, you know, sometimes it, it can get a little bit. What's the word I'm looking for? Not a, even argumentative or confrontational. We, we've got big differences of opinion, creative differences sometimes on things. And I think over the years, uh-huh. we've learned how to manage each other in terms of those. 
you know i i see things sometimes he sees things from a very male perspective and i see things from a very female perspective if the two perspectives are, are slightly different so like so for example when we're writing an email to someone he will write very kind of factually and stuff like that whereas i kind of tend to write quite emotionally yes um so like we'll look at something and i'll be like no, like that's too, that's too straight up. That's too straightforward. I don't think that's going to work. And he's like, but that's too, you know, you're going off on a tangent about something that's not relevant. <laughs> so, so we have these kind of creative differences. And, and he, he also like sometimes without even thinking about it, and I just think it comes from years of working in banking, I can be quite direct, you mm-hmm. know, and rather than, you know, perhaps playing to his, um, his creative nature and saying, um, I'm not too sure about that image or why don't we do something like this or like that. I would just, it just comes out my mouth. I don't like it. Um, mm. which, which doesn't go down very well. <laughs> it's funny <laughs> that, okay? <laughs> yeah. I don't mean it in a nasty way. I'll just be like, it's my initial thoughts and I know him well enough to know to not beat around the bush and I'll be, I don't like it. And then I have to pull myself back and go, and this is why and stuff like that. So he says that sometimes, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sympathetic to, to his creative needs, <laughs> something, something like that. So that's where kind of he and I run into a bit of trouble. But generally, it's over in an instant and stuff like that. But it's part of working together, right? We're different people. But at the same point, as much as we're different people, we bring out the best in each other. Well, that's the, that's the key, isn't it? I mean, yeah. this friction, this creative friction is great. Yeah. I mean, don't mm. get me wrong. He's very quick to tell me if he doesn't like something as well. So I think we're kind of a bit more comfortable in our own skin which is probably purely through longevity that we can you know (laughs) cut to the chase a little bit yeah yeah well it sounds like you have a deep level of trust and and less insecurity than perhaps because of age and longevity of relationship and really knowing each other and being comfy in your skin that's it sounds like you know there's discomfort there which of course and yeah, that is the yeah. thing we do laugh a lot and mostly at mm. each other um you know <laughs> rather than with each other but you know I, I for I think to quote my mum for quite an intelligent girl you can be quite ditzy sometimes and and she's she's got a point on that so generally you know we're not afraid we don't take us each other too seriously so you know we're not afraid to kind of call each other out on, on things like that but yes well it's, it's, isn't that isn't that crucial uh, not taking yourself too seriously and believing your own hype oh god no definitely not you know I, yeah I, I think you've got people around you and I think you are tr- you, you know what they say your vibe attracts your tribe so I've got mm. very people around me who are very very down to earth I don't think I would ever be allowed to kind of you know believe in my own puff I did go through a phase of that when I was in corporate when I was very young Um, And I remember that that wasn't the best period. I think it was my mum who told me to kind of get a bit of a hold of myself. But I say I was, I'm going to put that down to young, being young. (laughs) That's one of my favourite lines that you've said, believing in your own puff. I I can't remember who said it and I really wish I could, but somebody recently said about puff and bluff. And I was like, oh God, yeah, exactly. Um, it's probably why we get on really well, isn't it? Because you're both down to earth. I actually, I, I actually have this thing, um, both as an academic and, um, uh, you know, in the boardroom. I won't, I won't get involved with all the corporate speak or the or the lingo that goes with something. It isn't that I don't know it, by the way. Of course, I know it, and of course, I mean, I'm, I'm party to it. I just won't engage in it, so I'll cut through it because you know I just I used to like in my younger career. I think because I was kind of climbing and trying to get ahead and trying yeah. to get that promotion, you fall into a mold of of like and you know of of how you think that you're meant to be yes um, you know that that kind of mold and, and it was very much later on in my career and I just thought I just cannot be bothered with this shit I'm not gonna sit here and it's, excuse me if I'm not allowed to swear I very rarely swear um you know I I just thought I cannot I can't, I can't sit here and listen to it do you know what I mean anymore and I think that's I what I've done I knew uh-huh. I was at that point because I was becoming more and more vocally discontent you know, talking mm. about things that in the grand scheme of things are really not that important. And again, well, I think you, it's an age thing, right? Well, it is an age thing. And I mean, in some ways, I utterly agree with you. And in others, millennials are searching for meaning in in ways that other generations haven't as readily. You know, yeah. legacy, yes, but meaning, mm, not so much. And it's slightly different. So they come to it very much earlier. You know, you reminded me just before I forget, on the jargon piece, um, 
I had a, a, a VP of a very large organization that's a client write to me this week. And for some reason, I don't know who'd buggered up the times. So it doesn't really matter to me. But our, our call was, you know, our call didn't happen. And he said, to, he wrote a very quick, you know, email to me. Shusha, do we have our touch point on today or not? And I read this and I was like, <laughs> what? What's he talking about? Do we have a touch point on? I was thinking, do I have a touch point? Obviously, I know the word touch point. I was like, hang on. Does he mean meeting? He does. I think it also depends what industries you're talking to as well. Oh, you know, totally. Client, you know, um, so like even when I get emails, when they're from PRs, creatives, I always get a kiss at the end of the email, which is lovely. Right, oh, of course. Like my I wouldn't get mm. one of those from a corporate bank, you know. <laughs> I actually, I, 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 have a, I have a, I have a banker, a bank manager, which I know is very unusual. <laughs> Don't ask, but I have this this lovely bank manager, and uh, had had a bank manager facility for a while. And uh, I'm always sending in texts. We do texts, and oh, we're even that close. And I and I accidentally keep putting kisses to him, and he's he's just like, well, you know, <laughs> he just he just strides on through it because I forget. <laughs> I get it. Back in the heyday, you know, when I'd say payday, I'm talking about three months ago, um, when, yes. you, you know, you could afford such luxuries. I have an ironing man. I'm sure he doesn't do the ironing, but he comes in for 20 quid and it's the best 20 quid that I spend every week. And he would be the last to go. You know, he comes and picks up the ironing and stuff because I've not had a ch- chance to do it. I don't have him anymore because I can do my own ironing because I'm not as busy. So that's great. Mm. But he used to come and pick up the ironing and literally how many times I would sign off my text to him with kisses and then have to retext and say, I'm really sorry about the kisses. I didn't mean <laughs> the kisses. And he would, and eventually it would go off about four texts of him reassuring me the kisses weren't taken in the wrong way. <laughs> and me explaining myself. <laughs> it's so funny and so <laughs> silly. I to get rid of me, to be honest. <laughs> it's really funny. And it's, you were absolutely right. It's the context, oh, isn't I it? do it. It's like, oh my God, I've just put a kiss on the end of that text. And I know one of my kids did it to one of their teachers as well at the end of the email. <laughs> They've been mortified. They were like, it's, oh my God, what have I done? It's so cute. It really is. Now, you know, to wrap up, I'm wondering if, because you've obviously got an amazing relationship, you've got a fierce spirit that, you know, is a kind of, isn't a give up, <laughs> don't have a give up bone in your body as far as I can, I can hear. You um, have my day. Yeah, of course. You're human, <laughs> aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm not wondering for listeners what you would recommend in terms of amplifying fierceness, you know, particularly when we have, you know, a determination to make something happen that really matters to us. So I don't really think, I'm not thinking in terms of corporate, I'm not thinking in terms of a specific kind of, you know, go get them millions kind of, I'm not thinking that. I'm thinking in general, what, what's the kind of, what would you recommend for us to keep it going? I look at what makes me get up every morning and, you know, yeah. I have like what I call kind of my own, personal boardroom circle of trust thing ladies that I bounce stuff off of can tell when I'm feeling rubbish and stuff like that and that support from other women and men for that matter is invaluable to me and I just think that especially in current times and stuff you have to pay that forward so you know even sometimes you see something that someone's posted on social media and you respond, you know, someone that tells you, you know, you've got this, you can do this, get up another day, go and read this, go and give them resources and stuff like that. I think it's that thing around supporting others. So I would say that I very much survive through support of other people and that they give me and the encouragement and, you know, and the, the people that pick me up and dust me off and I graze my knees, which I do, you know, um, and I think just paying that forward to other people so that, because that energy is contagious, right? So I think that, that is, for me, the, the thing that is most important, you know, where can you lift others? Where can you lift others? I absolutely adore and have you to acknowledge. Well on your, you do that very well on your Facebook group. Oh, you thank know, you. The way that you respond to other people. So you are a, a natural lifter of women, which is lovely. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I one, it's it's absolutely you I'm thoroughly aligned with you on this and 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 know that it is about supporting others and and 
by that we we are supported in that you know movement there is a kind of symbiotic relationship isn't there it's not direct to the person that we've just supported because it can come from someone else but it, it's actually at the heart of it and secondly I really love as you spoke this this background music that came on <laughs> and, and it's like my try news alert they actually post a news alert when someone has a sneeze it's driving me nuts I'm gonna have to turn it off <laughs> like you know we had an accompaniment to your point and I always think they're really important they really are so we're going fair how about that yeah it was a fanfare news music I say (laughs) it's driving me nuts because literally they you get this news alert and you think oh my god something really important there and it and it is like someone's taking a sneeze or you know so someone's did this or done that it's really not relevant news alert so yeah yeah And, you know, I I recently, to talk to your point about supporting others, I recently found locally, because we've moved into the country, um, and and quite, you know, we don't have neighbours. We have one neighbour, but apart from that, we're really out in the sticks. And and I found a local cafe, and it's run by this amazing woman who who runs this cafe, very old-fashioned little cafe, with all these other older women who, you you know, I'm doing these painting things and beautiful painted up furniture and all sorts of things and she's you know it's had to close and and I have her number and I've been talking to her making sure that she's all right she's very much in the high risk and I had this little I had this little um text from her to say she's only been out once and so my children today have been creating a care box and it's oh. And and they hardly they've met her once because I actually it's my haven not theirs, but yeah, it, it's you know that. I'm not taking the kids there. I'm in place. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But the fact is, they've had so much um, joy. My children have had so yeah, much joy from amazing. making cards and finding things in the cupboard because we're going to take our food, obviously, and and you know creating this package this lovely hamper for her and it's less about it's less about what we're doing and more about the whole spirit of that yeah. fierce commitment to other people that's that I know you it's definitely it's not something that's a, a thought for you it's thoroughly at the heart of your life and you know it's it's I so much because your kids have had something to do that's got a purpose mm. that gives back and helps and help someone else and that will make her day and it will make a memory for her yes exactly and and that's beautiful and the thing is uh, what I know about this lady is that she is the woman who goes and supports everybody and so what I know about her and I don't need her to tell me is that there are very 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 few people actually that give that to her and so I know it's my job I don't she doesn't need to indicate it I know it that she needs somebody because she, she's the elder, and yep. you know she's in her seventies. She's holding everything together, and it's holding a lot of the community. It's really interesting, and and she. So who's looking after her? Yeah. And and I, I think that's really 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 important. Just to note on that term, elders. <laughs> I mm. was at a round table with some of the most senior women in the city. It was celebrating mm-hmm. someone's queen's honour. And it was an awesome room. It was one of those imposter moments for me. It's kind of looking around. These are women I massively respect, you know, mm. not only exceptional at their jobs, but again, they're true supporters of other women. And um, I said, I was, I was making a point about something. And I said, I kind of look to all of you guys because you are the elders. Now, bear in mind, these ladies are only in their 50s. So they're only like two years off of me. And they spent the most part <laughs> the cheeky of thing. backtracking out of <laughs> what was meant as a term of respect. Yes. That, totally went wrong thank god they'd all had a few glasses of wine because they laughed it off but i was mortified afterwards i was like vanessa please remember elders is really something you know for a much older lady and not people that are two years older than you so <laughs> oh yeah, my it god. always makes me laugh exactly that <laughs> i kind of use that term and even when i saw one of them just before the, or like lockdown i said i literally had to mention it i was like i did a bit to call you an elder they were still laughing so, what, yeah. what, what you're talking about though is it i am imagining it is in it in terms of impact and experience maybe absolutely that's exactly yeah. what i mean but it kind of came out all wrong like age because of course yeah whereas this lady really is in her 70s mid 70s I and mean, she was denying when when the government said about 70 or she was like well I, I i'm not i'm not really much into my 70s and i was like oh darling oh darling come well, on she's like that's the term i'm gonna use from now what, on what did you say 
gal pals. Wise pals. Wise pals, yes, wonderful. Owls, owls as in barn owls. Owls. <laughs> Wise owls. <laughs> Wise owls, I'll get there in a minute. That's amazing. <laughs> Wise owls. Yes. I don't know if I want to grow into a wise owl. I'm very age agnostic, so that will do. <laughs> yes. Oh, it's been an absolute pleasure, Vanessa. Thank you so much. Um, I, you. You're bright, my uh, day. <laughs> thank you, darling. <laughs> Take right. care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Vanessa, for joining me on the show. Isn't Vanessa absolutely wonderful, listeners? I mean, seriously, she is, isn't she? I'm so glad we were able to get honest about what being fierce really means. It's not about being a bitch. Of course it's not. It's a spirit of dogged determination to see something through. As usual, you can find the links to Vanessa's work in the full show notes over on schoolformothers.com forward slash podcast. That's schoolformothers.com forward slash podcast. Listeners, if you need a little extra support or guidance, head on over to the School for Mothers free Facebook group where you'll find myself and a group of ambitious, like-minded working mothers. Vanessa is part of that group, as you could hear. You can find us on Facebook by searching for School for Mothers group or follow the link in the show notes. I'm in the group every single day and would love to see you there. I really would. And of course, if you've loved what you heard today, and I hope you have, I would love for you to subscribe to this podcast and I'd be so grateful if you would leave a review. And if you're up for it, a five-star rating too, so I can continue to reach and support working mothers just like you. Well, that's it, listeners, till next week. Same time, same place. Meet me here. Thank you for joining us again. Here's to you. Stay safe. Thank you for tuning in to the School for Mothers podcast. To continue the conversation and keep your dose of inspiration up, head over to schoolformothers.com forward slash podcast, where you'll find bonus content from Danusha and her guests on habits, recommendations, books, best apps, time-saving secrets, life hacks, health, sleep and anything in between. That's schoolformothers.com forward slash podcast. 